go into the world and tell every man that you meet there is a man on the cross a catholic take what you need to know right now a bold synthesis of inspiration and information keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous catholic perspective a Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Coming from a secret bunker in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, just got to go to a, a wonderful press conference yesterday. I say wonderful only because of the people involved, Lepanto Institute, the Population Research Institute, a great people doing fantastic work, They're doing the kind of work that nobody else seems to want to do these days, and that's hold these organizations accountable. And specifically, I'm referring to the Catholic Relief Services. I mean, the report that they put out yesterday, which, by the way, we're linking to the full coverage. We live streamed the entire press conference that showed the receipts on what Catholic Relief Services has been up to and why they've just basically, you know, they, they like that government funding. They like that government funding so much that they're willing to sell themselves down the river when it comes to abortion, contraception, uh, sexual perversities, and all other kinds of immorality. The details are in going to be in the show notes today, so make sure to check that out at the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. I interviewed uh, Stephen Mosier, Michael Hitchborn, and others. I'm going to be bringing that content to you very, very soon. But today we're talking about conspiracies, plots, and secret societies. It's going to be a good conversation today. Brent Haynes is on the team. He's going to be talking about the Biden administration basically admitting the conspiracy theory that they were flying people over that border because why let them just cross over, you know, on feet when they can be flown over at taxpayer expense? Well, turns out that's true. Uh, that conspiracy turns out to be true. In fact, we're going to be covering that story with Brent Haynes at 14 past the hour. And then Professor Roberto de Matei is on the team. He wrote a book called The Paths of Evil, Conspiracies, Plots, and Secret Societies with Sophia Institute Press. In fact, we're going to be linking to that book today. If you go to sophiainstitute.com, we'll put a link to it in the show notes as well. But we're going to have a conversation about these paths of evil, conspiracies, plots, and secret societies, especially given in light of the fact that the Vatican most recently met with the Freemasons. We talked about that with Father Gerald Murray last week. We're going to have a conversation about that with Professor Roberto Di Mattei coming up at 30 past the hour. As I said, everything we cover is going to be in the show notes over at thestationofthecross.com forward slash A-C-T. But we have a lot to get to. Let's pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your Saint of the Day. Saint Thomas Aquinas, pray for us. The angelic doctor, also known as the universal doctor, was born the son of the Count of Aquino in the kingdom of Sicily around the year 1225. He displayed a philosophical mind from a young age and was educated first by the Benedictines at Monte Cassino, then at the University of Naples. In Naples, Thomas took the Dominican habit in his late teens, but his family disapproved and actually took him captive back to their estate where they tried to dissuade him. The tears and begging of his mother and sisters were to no avail, and at one point his brothers stooped so low as to pay a prostitute to seduce Thomas in the hopes that such a sin would ruin his resolve. Instead, the horrified saint drove the woman away with a flaming log, and from then on he was blessed with perfect chastity. Finally, Thomas was allowed to escape and fulfill his vocation to end the embarrassing situation. His prayers and piety would go on to sanctify the rest of his family, including his repentant brothers. Thomas studied under St. Albert the Great, and though his humble silence earned him the nickname the Dumb Ox from his fellow students, his intellectual bellow would soon echo through the world, as his master Albert predicted. Thomas went on to establish the preeminent school of thought for the Catholic Church through works like the Summa Theologica, though this masterpiece in particular remained unfinished after Thomas received a great vision of Jesus Christ, 
compared to which all the scholars' incredible earthly works, he said, were like mere straw. Thomas was deeply devoted to the Blessed Sacrament and composed the Mass and Office of the Feast of Corpus Christi, including the great hymn, Pange Lingua Gloriosi Corporis Mysterium, which is also sung on Holy Thursday. Thomas died on March 7th in the year of our Lord, 1274, and is also celebrated on January 28th in the modern calendar. For more about this day and others in the Church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saintsandseasons. St. Thomas now, Aquinas, pray for us. And now your headline news. Sorry about that, Jake. A Breitbart reports Nikki Haley drops out of Republican primary race. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley formally suspended her presidential campaign yesterday following her string of losses on Super Tuesday. Haley fell short of endorsing former President Donald Trump after spending weeks on the campaign trail attacking him. But she admitted, quote, in all likelihood, Donald Trump will be the Republican nominee when our party convenes in July. I congratulate him and wish him well, close quote. The Hill reports a Russian missile nearly hit Zelensky's motorcade. A Russian missile struck near Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's motorcade Wednesday in the city of Odessa. The missile hit about 490 feet from the motorcade, which was also uh, had uh, the Greek prime minister in it. That's not fun. Greek and Ukrainian officials continued on their way after the missile strike and held a meeting in the southern Ukrainian city on the Black Sea. And Catholic Vote reports New York sending National Guard to police subway. Democratic New York Governor Kathy Hochul announced Wednesday that her administration is sending the New York State Police and National Guard to monitor the Big Apple's crime-plagued subway system. The news comes after Democratic New York City Mayor Eric Adams decried migrant crime and called for changes to the city's sanctuary status. And those, those are your headline news. The gospel today comes to us from Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 39. In fact, I'm taking I'm taking the option today. It's a good option. You're going to love it. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not think that I have come to bring peace on earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes will be those of his own household. And he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake We'll find it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I know, I know, you, maybe you, I know I have. I, maybe you have as well, but how many times in our life have we had to make the tough decision? Hmm, blood relatives or the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? It's, a, it's not even a question anymore, is it? You have to choose. You have to choose. I choose Christ. I choose Christ over all things. Let the chips fall where they may. Haydock's commentary says, Dissension and war. In order that the false peace of sinners may be destroyed, and that those who follow me may differ in morals and affections from the followers of this world. You got to be different. You can't smell like, act like, taste like, and all the rest like this world, the flesh, and the devil. You have to be set apart. You have to be consecrated unto him. Set apart for what? For converting the world, to save the world, out of charity and love for the world. You got to meet the world where they're at, but you got to help them get where they got to go. It goes on, the sword, therefore, is the gospel, which separates those parents who remain in fidelity. It must be observed that the gospel does not necessarily of itself produce dissensions amongst men, but that Christ foresaw from the depravity of man's heart, the dissensions would follow the, uh, the propagation of the gospel. The blame of this, however, does not attach to the gospel itself, since those who embrace it after their conversion sought more than ever to keep peace with all men, even with their most bitter uh, persecutors, whilst those who reject the gospel, forgetting even the ties of kindred, persecuted even to death the followers of Christ. St. Jerome would say, 
For in the matter of belief in Christ, the whole world was divided against itself. Each house had its believers and its unbelievers. And therefore was this holy war sent that an unholy peace might be broken through. Hadock goes on to say, not that this was the end or design of the coming of our Savior, but that his coming and his doctrine would have this effect by reason of the obstinate resistance that many would make and of their persecuting all such as should adhere to him. St. Austin says, There are two kinds of crosses which our Savior here commands us to take up, one corporal and the other spiritual. By the former, he commands us to restrain the unruly appetites of the touch, taste, and sight. By the other, which is far more worthy of our notice, he teaches us to govern the affections of the mind and restrain all its irregular motions by humility, tranquility, modesty, peace, etc. Precious indeed in the sight of God and glorious is that cross which governs and brings under the proper rule the lawless passions of the mind. Close quote. St. Austin, pray for us. Where are you at in your decision making? Have you made that decision for Christ above all and everything else? Are you prepared to take up your cross today and to die along next to him on Calvary? Because that is the mission and call of every disciple. So it's a tough decision because we hold on to this world with everything we got. We just want a good life. We want blue skies and sunshine. We don't want to hang out in Shenandoah Valley with clouds out. We can't see the Blue Ridge Mountains. But nonetheless, let God's holy will be done in all things. Accept it as though it comes from his hand. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It is great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Coming up at 30 past the hour, we're going to have a conversation with Professor Roberto DiMattei. He's the author of a book. He's the author of like 30 some odd books, but The Paths of Evil, Conspiracies, Plots, and Secret Societies is one of his books, and it's published by SophiaInstitute.com. That's SophiaInstitute.com. We're going to put a link to it in the show notes over at the station of the cross.com forward slash ACT. We're going to have a conversation about conspiracies, plots, and secret societies, especially given in light of our most recent dialogue with the Freemasons. We talked about that with Father Gerald Murray, but we're going to have a conversation with Professor Roberto Di Matteo coming up at 30 past the hour. Do join us if you can. Lots of stories in the news that are of great concern to us, and no doubt they are to you as well. For instance, here's a conspiracy that uh, seems to be true. The Biden administration admits to flying 320,000 migrants secretly into the United States to reduce the number of crossings at the border as a national security vulnerabilities. I mean, a wall might have also done that, but hey, so can first class tickets on an airplane. He joins us now. Brent Ains, our friend, friend of the show, Catholic attorney and freedom fighter. Good morning to you, Brent. Thanks for being on the team. Good morning, Joe. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, this wow, is a, what a story. Relative, this is it's quite a story. Um, thanks to a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit by an organization called the uh, Center for Immigration Studies, uh, the uh, government has been discovered to actually be just flying people illegally. They're not following you know, the immigration law. The federal government is actually flying people into the United States from other countries. And the only thing these people had to do to qualify was to use the app created by the Biden administration. Wow. So they used this app. They then got a free flight to the United States. And then they were released in the United States. They, you know, the legal term, of course, is they were paroled for two years to basically uh, do whatever they want in the United States. So you can't make this stuff up. You know, we've seen those of us who pay attention to the news. We've seen, you know, we've seen the video of people just swarming across the border. And now the Biden administration uh, has been discovered to be flying these people into the United States. It, you know, it's it's an extraordinary story. I mean, 
Joe, the only other way the government, the Biden administration, can make it easier for people to immigrate to the United States would be as, as if they went door to door in foreign countries and said, would you like a free flight to the United States? Um, That's bizarre. I, uh, it really shows you that and other actions. It really shows you the depth and breadth to which this administration will go and the woke advocates who support these policies and enact these policies. It shows you how far they are willing to go to simply bring anybody and everybody into the United States. I remember back in the uh, Obama administration, all of the talk about the North American trade agreement and open borders and all of this. I mean, it seems like the Biden administration is getting done what the Obama administration only dreamed of, which is open borders, wall or no wall, National Guard in Texas or no. It doesn't matter. They're finding ways to to get around every single obstacle, pun intended, and allow anybody and everybody to come across the border. And they're going to go so far as to put them on airplanes and fly them there if it becomes that that difficult to do. Why in the world, Brett, would they would they want such uncontrolled um, migration, ma- mass migration to come across that border? What, what what purpose does this serve? New York Governor Kathy Hochul is having to send uh armed troops into the subway systems because the crime is so bad there things aren't looking good for our country one word joe voters and people might think it's a conspiracy theory you know they might they might think that that's just unduly uh pessimistic or cynical but that really is the answer the democrat party sees these people as future voters they will come into the united states and there will be tremendous pressure at some point to simply grant them amnesty those of us who are old enough to remember what happened in the 1980s remember that there was tremendous pressure which in retrospect just seems almost laughable compared to what we're dealing with now but in the 1980s uh the immigration issue became such a large issue, such an important issue and such a contested issue that Ronald Reagan passed legislation in the 1980s that Ronald Reagan, who was president of the United States at the time, signed an amnesty bill. He signed it into law. And the idea was that, you know, they would fix the border, they would fix the immigration system, and that this would be a one-time amnesty. Well, obviously it wasn't. You know, fast forward approximately 40 years, and we have millions and millions of immigrants here illegally. They haven't gone through the the process. They're now literally being not just shown the door into the country at the border. They're literally being flown in at taxpayer expense. And the only rationale for it is that the Democrat Party wants to have voters. And in case people really think this is too cynical of you, here's something that's not discussed very often. And the complexities in the way it will play play out aren't exactly clear. But remember, we apportion the United States Congress uh, every 10 years. We apportion the House of Representatives, to be more precise, because every state gets two senators. Joe non-legal or illegal immigrants are counted in the United States census when we apportion members of the House of Representatives. And that had always been the case. And finally, under uh, Trump, they tried to stop it. There was a case that went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled, no, you have to count people because the census basically says count inhabitants, and they are inhabitants. So, it's it's really hard for anybody who does who supports this these open door policies to deny that that is the effect of them, even if they want to deny that that is the purpose. But really, when you look at the the different actions that a lot of politicians do, and it's not just Democrats, you know, often it's Republicans too. But this issue is uh, almost overwhelmingly on the, on supported by by the one political party over the other, when you look at what they do to maintain power, when you look at what they do to obtain power, when you look at how they exercise power, the ultimate answer is they want to bring these people in the United States because they want, at least from the politician's point of view, they want to expand their voter base. Now you also but wouldn't you say, need- though, Brent, let me, let me just jump in real quick, because wouldn't you say that uh, to that point that more and more people on the other side of the political aisle are basically getting fed up? I think we're seeing pushback 
across uh, across the the divide here, across the aisle. I mean, we're seeing people who are staunchly Democrat come out publicly and say, "This is ridiculous. This must stop. We must do something. Build the wall. You know, let's enforce uh, our our laws on the border. Let's do this in a more rational way." So I'm. I guess I'm surprised, but I guess my big question is: Are is this this agenda that we're seeing played out here? Is this going to push our country to a breaking point? Are we going to see well, this go too far? And the citizenry. I mean, we've already seen what what happens in 2022 and and the and the riots across this country. Could you see a day where we get to that kind of uh, that level of uh, of uh, we're done with this? Well, first, the, the first effect is going to be, aside from whether or not these people are allowed to vote or whether they're granted asylum, the first uh, effect to consider is the economic effect. Only one of two things can happen. Either this massive number of immigrants obtain jobs, which is good for them, and it's good that they're providing for themselves when they obtain jobs, but that drives down wages for other people. You know, people... In Alabama, people in you know West Virginia, people in Arkansas, people in Oklahoma, people in Iowa who are looking for jobs now have to compete with with illegal immigrants. And the greater the supply, the more the employer can lower wages, the less they have to pay. That's just basic supply and demand. An increase in immigrants causes the wages to go lower. Now you'll hear, and this is just a complete fraud, you will hear people say, well, immigrants do jobs Americans don't want to do. That is absolutely false. What happens is immigrants will do jobs at lower wages than Americans would do those jobs for. But the, and the, the jobs would be done by the Americans and they would earn more and employers would have to pay more except for the fact that they now have the immigrant who comes over and says, sure, I'll do that at a cheaper rate. So that's the first thing is the effect on jobs. Now, Joe, what happens if they they don't get jobs? What happens if they don't work? Well, we are a humane society. We don't just let people starve. You know, despite the numbers of people you see in many large cities who are homeless, those people overwhelmingly suffer from addiction problems or mental health problems. That's a completely separate conversation. But immigrants who don't get jobs and drive down wages on the one side of the scale, what are they going to do? They're going to get welfare. They will uh, eventually qualify for Social Security. They, They will obtain other government benefits. Who pays for those benefits, Joe? The taxpayers. So they're either driving down wages on the one hand or they're driving up the tax burden on the other. And, you know, that's a little uh, simplistic way to look at it. But ultimately, overall, that is the net effect. It's one of those two. As for the larger cultural uh, changes, the pre- President Biden himself has bragged about how the United States will become, you know, less than 50 percent white, how we will become a majority minority country. And he said in his way, the way that Biden does, he goes, and that's a good thing. Well, you know, why? Why are the advocates for unlimited immigration, why are they so insistent on bringing in people who don't come from cultures that share the traditional Western civilization values? Why? Because these people despise those values. How do we know that? Because all you have to do is look at the policies and the ideas that they teach children in the schools. All you have to do is think of all the other issues that you and I have talked about many times on this program. You know, they're not flying in um, illegal immigrants from Ireland or France or England or Spain or Italy. They're not doing that. They're not bringing them in from Poland, for gosh sakes. We wouldn't want any practicing Catholics coming into the United States. No, they're bringing them in from other countries um, According to this report, they're cut, these are flights um, almost entirely from Central and South America. But it just shows you how far they will go. Uh, another news item that just came out last month, Joe, is that in San Francisco, a non-citizen, someone who's not even legal to vote, a non-citizen was put on the San Francisco Election Commission by the San Francisco government. Of course. Think about yeah, I reported the story. Uh, Right. A non-citizen was put on the election commission. So uh, there are jurisdictions who have tried 
to grant voting rights in certain elections, such as local elections, to people who are not United States citizens. And there are other consequences that are bad for the immigrants themselves. There's now a report out, and this, by the way, goes back decades. This has been known. You, people can go on the Internet and search for this. But there are Chinese criminal gangs that simply smuggle human beings. And it is horrible for these people. You know, they will lie to them. They will promise them. They bring them to the United States, and they end up working in brothels. They end up working in uh, drug, you know, drug wow. labs. And the Chinese gangs are working to bring people in the United States. You know, this is a serious, large problem. But Joe, come November, most of the Democrats who are complaining about immigration are going to come home politically, and they're going to vote for the party that supports open immigration. Yeah. Yeah, and we're going to get what we deserve in the end. High crime and all the rest. Uh, The Lake and Riley story is just the beginning of it all. And this isn't good for those immigrants that are coming across that border either. So let's not forget that we are a people of compassion and mercy. But this is not merciful. This is disordered and chaotic, and that is not how this should be done. Brent Haynes, thank you for your input on that. We'll be right back. We have Professor Roberto DiMatteo on the team. We're going to be talking about conspiracy theories, plots, and secret societies. All that and more is coming next. Don't go anywhere. Download the app to take our programming with you wherever you go. Hear what listeners are saying about the regularly updated iCatholic Radio app. The programs on iCatholic Radio are uplifting, educational, and have served to deepen my faith as a Catholic. Thank you for this amazing station. Download the free iCatholic Radio app in your Android or Apple store today. If you already have the app, please consider giving us a five-star review or telling a friend about it. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and here, here your headline news. The National Catholic Register reports Orthodox and Catholic prelates in Russia sharply criticize fiducia supplicans. In a March 1st statement following a two-day plenary assembly in southern Russia, the Conference of Catholic Bishops of Russia stressed that, quote, in order to avoid temptation and confusion, close quote, they wish to draw attention to the fact that blessings of any kind of couples who persist in morally irregular relationships from a Christian perspective, cohabitation, remarriage, or of same sex, are unacceptable. The bishops underscored that despite the confusion following the release of the document, Fiducia Supplicans, Catholic teaching on family and marriage remains unchanged, and that the church blesses and surrounds marital unions and families with pastoral care. LifeSite News reports, conservatives win Ontario by election by widest margin in 20 years. Conservative candidate Jamil Javani has won the Durham, Ontario by-election with 57% of the vote, with the second-place Liberal candidate Robert Rock garnering just 22.5% of the vote. Javani's victory is the largest the Conservatives have had in the riding electoral district in 20 years and presents a 11% increase compared to 2021. The Durham by-election comes after months of polling, which predicted a massive conservative victory in the fall and the forthcoming fall 2025 federal election. Similarly, February research projects that if the election were called right now, conservatives would form a majority government, capturing 194 of 338 seats, leaving the liberals in second place with just 76 seats. Boy, for Canada's sake, I pray that is in fact true. And Catholic News Agency reports John Paul II Shrine considering whether to remove mosaics by Father Rupnik. In light of several serious accusations of abuse against Catholic artist Father Marco Rupnik, the Knights of Columbus told the CNA that they are carefully considering the best course of action, considering the priest's mosaic that adorned the JP2 National Shrine in Washington, D.C. Calls to remove the priest's artwork from places of worship have been mounting around the world, yet extensive Rupnik artwork in the John Paul II Shrine remains in place. Well, dear Knights of Columbus, let me make this easy for you. Spend all the money you have to remove his artwork because it must be gone. And when you're done, go to San Giovanni Rotondo and remove it from St. Padre Pio Shrine as well because it's horrible. And those those are your headline news. St. Padre Pio, pray for us. Hey, uh, there is a great book out by Sophia Zetou Press. And uh, it's uh, 
It's by Professor Roberto Di Mattei. It's The Paths of Evil, Conspiracies, Plots, and Secret Societies. We're going to link to it. SophiaInstitute.com is their website, SophiaInstitute.com. But Professor Roberto Di Mattei, he is joining us now. He is the author of, of many books, actually. He's also the president of Lepanto Foundation and the editor of the magazine, Radici Cristiani. He joins us. Good morning to you, Professor Roberto Di Mattei. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. I'm very grateful for your time today. Uh, I, I was uh, fascinated with your book in particular. Um, I want to talk about conspiracies, plots, uh, secret societies, Gnostic sects of all kind, because we seem, especially in our modern time, but you point out in your book, because it's really a history book, that there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, conspiracies have gone all the way back to the Garden of Eden and uh, the, the age of revolution, the bloody age of revolution that is upon us. Uh, seems to be uh, full of these conspiracies, these secret societies. But I also saw that you have an article out uh, over at Rorate Chaley uh, on the Freemason dialogue that the Vatican just held. And I thought, how apropos, we must get you on the team. So I wanted to talk to you about that. Let me start with the book first and ask you the question, why, why are we so given over to conspiracy theories? I think that uh, above all, uh, it is important to uh, understand uh, um, whether uh, socio -psycho psychological criteria are enough to formulate a conspiracy uh, the theory. Because uh, uh, one of the problems today is, it is uh, the fact that uh, there are not uh, right criteria to approach uh, the, the, the important, a very important question of the conspiracy theory. Uh, so, in my view, conspiracy theories uh, are philosophies of history, which cannot be understood in a purely um, psychological, political, or, or sociological perspective, uh, reducing uh, reality to the mere factual uh, plane. Of course, uh, the the the, the, uh, the social sciences like uh, sociology and uh, other social sciences can uh, contribute to understanding uh, historical events because every human action has psychological or sociological uh, roots, but. When um, the, the psychological and uh, sociological theories presume uh, to offer the, the final explanation of uh, reality, uh, they fall into reductionism, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, most widespread uh, uh, errors of our age. Um, and so I, I think that a historian, I, I am an historian, uh, cannot uh, proceed without having a philosophy of history. Mm. And in the case of a Catholic historian, as I am, a, a theology of history. So I agree with uh, the philosopher of history, um, Juan Donoso Cortes, uh, who wisely remarked, uh, remarked that uh, every uh, political and uh, social truth has as its foundation, a, a theological truth. Because uh, theology is the science that embraces uh, every social science. And uh, according to the Catholic theology, God uh, creates, uh, preserves, and uh, directs all things to their uh, appropriate uh, end. Mm. But... Uh, uh, but uh, the, the, the problem it is that the conspiracies and the secret societies exist uh, because man, bounded uh, uh, by original sin, is inclined to evil, and uh, um, and his uh, social nature uh, leads him to unite with other men in uh, carry out evil plans. Mm. You say in the book, we might ask the question at this point, considering the existence of a variety of secret societies, this is from your second chapter, and occult forces that run throughout history, is it possible to speak of one great conspiracy to which the individual plots and conspiracies, or at least some of them, can be attributed? I kind of got the sense that it's the it, it kind of boils down to 
the Catholic Church and in the world of flesh and the devil in complete opposition. And you even quote Professor uh, uh, Plenio, uh, who talks about, you know, the, the age of re the revolutionaries, uh, the, re the the constant yeah. revolutionaries throughout history. So is can we just boil all of the conspiracies, the plots, the, the secret societies, the secret Gnostics? Can we boil this down to uh, the world, the flesh and the devil against the Catholic Church? Uh, yes, I, uh, of course, I, I think I think so. And uh, you have um, quoted um, Professor Pino Corre de Oliveira, his uh, uh, work um, about um, the revolution and the counter-revolution. So the history of the revolution is very important. And of course, uh, uh, during this history of revolutions, a, a, a crucial, very dec decisive moment is the French Revolution, because the e epoch which opened with the French Revolution um, is, uh, is very important for the role of the, the, the uh, of the role of uh, Freemasonry in the French Revolution, a role which was demonstrated by many scholars. Mm -hmm. um, the French Revolution was the result of, of the convergence of, of different interests uh, and uh, objectives uh, against the backdrop of the profound uh, transformation, uh, transformation of ideas and the traditions of the 18th uh, century. But the destruction of throne and uh, altar in France and uh, in Europe was a secret objective um, of the free, free, free masonry, and uh, not only f by the free, free masonry, but uh, uh, also uh, it was uh, uh, the, the, the objective of a secret society that had uh, developed within the free masonry. I speak um, about the Bavarian Illuminati, or more precisely, mm. the Order of the Illuminati, founded in uh, 1776 by. Um, Adam Weishaupt in, in Bayern, and uh, connected to the uh, Bavarian Illuminati, uh, there were, uh, for example, uh, the um, uh, ultra Jacobin ex um, exponents of the French Revolution. Um, I remember in my book the name of uh, uh, Babeuf, uh, a, a fanatical uh, disciple of uh, Robespierre, and uh, and. Uh, his follower, Filippo Buon Buonarroti, uh, Babeuf uh, attempted a, a, an insurrection in France known as the conspiracy of the equals, um, which, um, with which he sought to overthrow the, 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 the directory and uh, reintroduce the, the Jacobinism in France, but mm. failed. Uh, and um, his follower, Bonarotti, founded the perfect uh, sublime masters uh, um, uh, around uh, uh, at the beginning of, uh, beginning of the 19th century. And uh, the, this uh, secret society, the perfect uh, masters, was a secret, uh, a secret revolutionary society which um, drew on uh, the program of the, of the, the Illuminati. I remember in my book that uh, um, uh, James Billington, who is a, in a history professor uh, at Harvard and Princeton, in a, in a very interesting book uh, um, titled uh, Fire in the Mind of Men, Origin, Origins of the Revolutionary Faith, uh, writes, um, uh, no, in this book he identifies um, Buonarroti as the apostle of a conspiracy that links the French Revolution with the communist revolutions in Eastern Europe and Asia. Yeah. And then um, it's on rise that, uh, um, that, that there is a, a, a revolutionary tradition, uh, the history of an elite, a final line of apostolic suc succession from Bonarotti, from, from the Illuminati to to Lenin. So you see the the uh, the history that there is a, a, a something like a, a something similar to, to to the Catholic Church because in the Catholic Church we, we have a real yes. apostolic 
apostolic section from St. Peter's to, 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 to our, for, 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 for the bishops, uh, contemporary. Mm-hmm. But there is also in the, in the secret society a, a, an attempt to, to reproduce the, the, a, a counter church. Uh, an uh, anti-church uh, based on the uh, same principles. So one of the so so you, you, we know, for example, that, that the Catholic Church, uh, as a doctrine, uh, has uh, um, his uh, sacraments or rites and has uh, his own uh, succession. And mm-hmm. also in the secret society, there is a doctrine, there are rites, there is a succession. Hold that thought right there. Professor Roberto Di Matteo is our guest. We're talking about his book, uh, The Paths of Evil, Conspiracies, Plots, and Secret Societies, which, by the way, we're going to be linking to in the show notes, but you can find it at sophieinstitute.com. But I want to come back on the other side of the break and talk about your article, uh, Professor Di Matteo, The Church and Freemasonry, The Secret February 16 Meeting in Milan. Uh, very interesting because to the point you just made, the Grand Master BC himself made this point. Freemasons, they are competitors to the Catholic Church. They are competing for dominance in religion and philosophy. And it is, in fact, tied to communism. I agree. More on that is coming up right after this break. Don't go anywhere. We're going to link to everything in the show notes. But we'll be right back with more of A Catholic Take. Share us with a friend. Jesus Christ, welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean. It's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. At the top of the hour, we say goodbye to the radio audience. We're going to stay live on the video feed for the after show. And I want to tell you about my time yesterday at the press conference for the Lepanto Institute and the Population Research Institute. Uh, They have uh, a report out. We're going to link to it in the show notes. We did the live video stream from that. We streamed the entire conference for you so you can see the evidence the receipts against the catholic relief services and what they've been complicit in uh purporting abortion and uh you know masturbation contraception all kinds of perversities they have partnered with groups that are that are conducting these 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 evils every single day in in africa and beyond you can get the receipts the details the accusations the allegations all of that but i'll share some of that in the after show we're having a conversation right now with professor roberto de mate about his book the paths of evil conspiracies plots and secret societies by sophia institute Dot com, But he also has an article from Marate Chaley, The Church and Freemasonry, The Secret February 16 Meeting in Milan. Uh, Professor Dimitri, welcome back to the, the show. Thank you again for your time today. In your article, you point out, and again, we're going to be linking to this, you point out how the Grand Master BC of the, uh, Grand, the Grand Orient uh, Lodge of Italy He basically makes the same point that you made before the break in that the Freemason, which, by the way, for transparency, I was a third degree master Mason before becoming Catholic. My father is 32nd degree Scottish Rite. So I am familiar with the secret rites and liturgies of Freemasonry. I've spoken about it often on my radio show. But uh, BC here, he points out that, in fact, Freemasonry was a competitor, is a competitor to the Catholic Church. And um, and it seems strange to me, and I want to get your take on this, Professor Dimite. Why, when the Catholic Church has so clearly taught that there are big problems with secret societies, that they have been at war with the Catholic Church now for centuries, and we can't be members of them, why in the world with high would high ranking uh, prelates from the Vatican be in dialogue with them? What is the goal? What do they hope to accomplish? Yes, um, this is the, the, the problem because uh, because uh, the, the great master BZ, as you said, uh, make uh, made a, a, a strong speech um, in, with the exaltation of the, the um, Freemasonry and opening uh, the, the, the the door to the Catholic Church, but in this in his uh, speech. 
he has uh, criticized um, the Catholic Church, which has seen a Freemasonry as a potential competitor in the spiritualization and the elevation of, of, of a man. But um, forgetting uh, busy to say that uh, um, if uh, the Catholic Church uh, has condemned the Freemasonry, it is because Freemasonry has opposed, fought, uh, misrepresented the, the Church over the past uh, three uh, ch- uh, centuries. And uh, and so the the problem, the real problem, was not the 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 position of, of uh, the great master Busy, which is coherent with uh, his um, anti-Catholic uh, view. But the problem it is that in this meeting, uh, which uh, happened the, the 16th of um, February, the last month. Um, the, this this meeting was uh, in uh, in uh, Milan and uh, it was opened by the Archbishop uh, of Milan, Mario Mario Del Pini, uh, who gave the opening address, and um, and the Cardinal Coco Palmerio, uh, an important Cardinal, former President of the Pontifical Council for Legislative Text. He gave the the, the, the closing uh, uh, address, uh, and so um, so this is uh, the, this is uh, the problem, Be- because also recently in a, a um, in a document of the Congregation um, of uh, the, the the Faith, um, Freemason Freeman, sorry was condemned, so it, it was a. a Quite good uh, do- document, uh, but uh, but nevertheless, uh, this dialogue uh, continues. Why this? Because I think that since uh, the time of Vatican II, there is a, an attitude within the Catholic Church. This is uh, um, the uh, the uh, idea that there are no more enemies. Uh, so the uh, antagonism uh, between uh, the church, the Catholic Church, and the, the world uh, is uh, finished. There is no more that uh, militant uh, spirit, which was a characteristic for centuries, for um, many centuries of the Catholic of the Catholic Church. And there is the idea that it is possible. Uh, uh, to find an agreement uh, with the modern world, which in, f- which in fact uh, is um, completely against the Catholic Church, because because of all of the uh, the doctrine, the ideology, the atmosphere of the world uh, in which we are we are immersed, it is completely antithetic to the. Uh, doctrine uh, and to the principles of uh, of the Catholic Church, and uh, according to the magisterium of the Church, the uh, among the the, the different uh, secret societies, the, the mother sect, um, permanent uh, personification of a revolution. This is the the a definition around which all the others are organized as simple auxiliary forces. Well, the, the, the mother sect is Freemasonry. Mm. Uh, and this is revealed clearly from the pontifical documents uh, that have repeatedly condemned it, uh, the Freemasonry, over the centuries. So the first Papal condemnation of Freemasonry dates to the apostolic letter in Eminenti of Clement XI in 1738, a document which ordered the bishops to proceed against the Masons as persons suspected of heresy. And from then, so 1738 to uh, to, to, to our time, uh, the condemnations of, of Freemasonry followed uninterrupted, uh, but uh, but at, at the same time, in the last uh, um, 20, 30, 40 years, there were 
many meetings um, among Catholic uh, representative uh, and uh, ex- exponents of the Freemasonry um, in search of, of uh, an impossible um, collaboration because there is no there, there is no a, a, a bad uh, atheistic and uh, anti-clerical Freemasonry and a good religious and spiritualist Freemasonry as um, many people uh, uh, believe. Mm. No, there are people uh, who make the distinction between the Latin, which is uh, the left wing, and the Anglo-American uh, Freemasonry, which would be the right wing. You know, the most. But in reality, no lodges um, the first degrees are overlaid with the Masonic high degree systems, uh, which are very anti Catholic. Professor Roberto Di Matteo, I'm grateful for your time today. Thank you very much for, for being on the show with us. Uh, we're going to link to your Thank book you. and your article, The Paths of Evil, Conspiracies, Plots, and Secret Societies by SophiaInstitute.com. Check out the show notes today over at the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. Let's pray for the total conversion of those Freemasons. That's what we ought to be doing. Professor Dimitri, God bless you and God love you. Tomorrow on the program, Mike Koeniger fills in for me and uh, Michael Beerlander, Fatima Farm, and Michael Hitchborner on the show tomorrow. Join us there. We'll be in the after show next. God love you.